So this is problem 38 from chapter 22. And it's a very typical application of Cauchy's law in electrostatics. Uh, in this problem, you have a cylindrical, long cylindrical rod, and it's enclosed in a cylindrical shell. So let me just draw these, if I can. So this is my cylindrical shell. And inside this, there's a cylindrical rod. And so this one extends this way. This also extends that way. So there's stuff in here, in here. But in between them, uh, there's, some, there's some empty space. Okay? And they give us the radii. So, so going from inside to outside, uh, the inner radius, the radius of the inner rod uh, is R1. The inner radius of the cylindrical shell uh, is R2. The outer radius of the cylindrical shell is R3. So we have R1, R2, and R3. And both the cylindrical rod and the cylindrical shell have uniform charge densities of rho E. Okay. Uh, so from that, you can immediately tell that these are actually insulators, because otherwise they will be uniform distributed. Everything will uh, accumulate to the, to the surface. Since it's uniform distributed, this must be, these must be insulators. And they're asking for the electric field uh, at the four regions. So inside the cylindrical rod, in between the cylindrical rod and the cylindrical shell, inside the cylindrical shell and outside the cylindrical shell, outside uh, everything. And they are telling us that these are long, uh, long cylindrical objects, uh, which means that uh, there's some translational symmetry that wherever you move, uh, things are not going to change. Now, uh, I'm not going to solve this problem in full, but I'm just going to demonstrate uh, how this could, be, this could be done. So let me uh, choose a region. So I'm going to choose a region that's uh, inside the outer cylindrical shell, so somewhere between R2 and R3. Okay. So I want to calculate the electric field in that region. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a cylinder, a hypothetical cylinder, a Gaussian surface. Okay whose axis coincides with the axis of these two cylinders and whose radius lies over there. Okay. And I'm far from the edges of this construction. <coughs> so I don't, I don't care about the edge effects. Okay, so this is going to be my R and my uh, R is going to be between R3 and R2. Okay. And I want to calculate this electric field at R. Let's put it this way. Okay. So what will the electric field here look like? Now, on the surface of, this, of the cylinder, what I mean. So it is going to be, I don't know uh, if this is immediately clear, but it is going to be in an outward direction and perpendicular to the side of the cylinder, so parallel to the bottom and the top faces of the cylinder. Now, why? Why, why will it be in that direction? Because I'm far from the edges. When I'm far from the edges, I'm going to have some translational symmetry, uh, which means that uh, I can't actually tilt one way or the other. Okay? I can't tilt one way or the other, so I must be purely in the radial direction. And this is going to be correct for every direction on the face of the cylinder. It's going to be just outward and perpendicular to the perpendicular to the direction of the uh, perpendicular to the uh, face of the cylinder. Okay. So I'm going to have some electric field that's like going this way over here. And this is a closed Gaussian surface, so my surface element is also going to have a direction that's perpendicular to the surface. So I'm going to have a surface element that's parallel to the electric field on the face, uh, on the face of the, on the side of the cylinder. On the circular faces at the top and at the bottom, the dA, my surface element, is going to be uh, parallel to the axis of the cylinder. So here it's that way, here it's going to be that way, and that is going to be uh, perpendicular to the electric field. Okay? So the electric field here 
there's distraction, here is distraction. Da, da, da. So as I go uh, down to the axis of the cylinder, it's always going to be in the radial direction, and that radial direction is always going to be perpendicular to this normal vector to the faces. So uh, the electric field is going to be parallel to the face because this is a normal vector, it's perpendicular to the face. The electric field on the face is going to be perpendicular to the normal vector. Okay. With that preparation, now I can write down Gauss's law and try to solve it. So Gauss's law says that for a closed surface, the dot product of the electric field integrated over the surface is going to be the charge enclosed uh, divided by epsilon naught. Okay. So let me actually move this a little bit up so I will have some space uh, to carry out some algebra. Enclosed. Okay, so we are going to have, uh, we are going to have to do a couple of things. First one is to calculate the enclosed charge in our cylinder. So to do that, I'm going to assign a length to my cylinder. I will just call this L. So what will be the, uh, what will be the uh, enclosed charge for L? Now there's going to be some charge coming from the inner cylindrical rod and there's going to be some charge coming from the uh, outer cylindrical shell. Right? So this Q enclosed is going to be Q coming from the rod plus the Q coming from the shell. So what is the Q coming from the rod? So I have a portion of this rod uh, that is of length L. It is of radius uh, R1. Uh, so it's a cylinder, I can calculate its volume, multiply by rho e, I can calculate the total charge. Okay. So this is going to be just rho e times volume of the rod uh, over L, plus there's going to be some charge coming from the shell, this is going to be rho e times volume of the shell over L. Okay. Now it is easy to calculate the volume of the road. So this is a cylinder. Uh, for a cylinder, uh, the volume is just, so let me just put it this way. Uh, the volume is just going to be the base area times the uh, height. The height here is L. The base area is pi r1 squared. L pi r1 squared. So this is the volume of the, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the volume of the cylinder, the rod. And the volume of the shell is going to be a little bit trickier. So this is going to be uh, the, again, it's the base area times the height, but the base area is not going to be just uh, R squared, but it's going to be R squared minus R2 squared. Okay, so uh, if I look at this from face on, uh, this is going to be the shell like this. My R is passing through over here. I'm interested in this part. So the total area of this is capital R squared. I will then subtract off the inner area, which is capital R2 squared. But otherwise, it's the same deal. So this is plus L pi um, R squared minus R2 squared. So this will be the charge enclosed. Now it's a bit perhaps uh, tedious, but I think it is correct. Now for the left-hand side, okay, I need to calculate uh, an integral. Okay? So let's calculate that integral. So I, I will need to erase this because I'm not going to have space. So first of all, this integral uh, can be divided into three parts. The face of the cylinder, the uh, upper uh, circular face, and the lower circular face. So I'm going to call this top, bottom, and the face. Okay? So uh, this is a dot product. That dot product vanishes at the top and the bottom, and it turns into a simple product uh, over the face. Now it vanishes at the top and bottom because these two vectors are perpendicular to each other at the top and bottom faces, and it becomes a simple product because these two vectors are parallel to each other over the face. So this 
or hole over the cylinder over all faces, stuff becomes now not a closed integral anymore, EDA. And this is the face of the cylinder is equal to something, something, okay? Whatever we wrote, this Q, we've calculated before, divided by epsilon naught. Now, there is one further simplification I can make. This thing, it has cylindrical symmetry, so not only it does it have translational symmetry along the uh, axis, it also has rotational symmetry around the axis, which means that the magnitude of the electric field, this is no longer a vector, but just magnitude, the dot product became a simple product. The magnitude is constant. Okay, because this is cylindrical symmetry, the, the electric field magnitude must be the same in every direction, so I can take this out. Not the A, and now I'm just integrating over uh, the face of the cylinder these little uh, area elements. Okay, and those area elements, when added up, is just going to give me uh, the area of the face, and the area of the face I can easily calculate. This is going to be E times, so the area, uh, you can just open this up and it becomes a rectangle. Uh, one side of the rectangle is just going to be L. The other side is going to be the circumference of this, uh, which is going to be two pi R. So this is two pi R times L. And that is equal to Q enclosed that we calculated before divided by epsilon naught. And, uh, you're just going to move this to the other side. There's going to be some cancellations. One cancellation that has to take place is that it should not depend on L, right? Remember, this is our Gaussian surface. It's completely hypothetical. It's not real. Uh, it's perfectly our choice. We can choose this to because uh, we have that freedom in choosing the length of the cylinder. Uh, it should not depend on that number, okay? And indeed, uh, if I recall correctly, there was some uh, L on the right-hand side for this. Q enclosed, and the L's are going to cancel. It should depend on R. It should depend on R, uh, that's fine. Or it could depend on R, I should say. Uh, but the L dependence uh, should go away. Okay? And as I said, I'm not going to solve this in detail, uh, but this is how you proceed with this. And this is a very typical application of uh, Gauss's law in cylindrical systems. Uh, so when they are telling you that you have long cylinders, you not only assume there's translational symmetry, uh, well, you, you assume there's translational symmetry, but you not only assume that they are very long, uh, but also you're far from the edges. Right? So the edge effects don't cancel, uh, don't matter. And because edge effects don't matter, your electric field for this cylindrical symmetric charge distribution is going to be purely in the radial direction, away from the axis. Okay? Uh, and at a given distance from the axis, the magnitude of the electric field is going to be constant. So if you can turn this into a uh, regular product where you have the magnitude rather than the uh, component or anything like that, you can just take this out, it's going to be constant.